Welcome, everyone. Um, we're recording this session as Zoom has let you know. We have also enabled the live transcript for closed captioning, and you may find that option on the control bar that usually appears at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We're extending to you the warmest welcome to this second ASLI Spotlight on new work in the environmental humanities and eco-criticism. I'm Bethany Wigan, Director of the Program in Environmental Humanities at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm proud to be with Laura Barbas Roden, the co-president of ASLI. For those of you joining an ASLI event for the first time, we extend an extra hearty welcome. ASLI is a professional organization that seeks in our mission statement to inspire and promote intellectual work in the environmental humanities and arts. We are so glad for you to join us today and invite you to help sustain and further our work by becoming an ASLI mem member. Before we continue, I would like to acknowledge that my university and I myself today, we are located on the ancestral homelands of the Leni Lenape, sometimes known as Delaware people who long stewarded the lands, waters and life of Lenape Hoking. The headquarters of the recognized Delaware tribe are presently in Oklahoma and Texas, and yet Lenape remain here neighbors and stewards of this land renamed after English Quaker and settler colonist William Penn. And while Penn sought to maintain friendly and fair relations with Lenape neighbors, his colonial successors, his children, and his agents did not. I want especially to point out that the foundation of the University of Pennsylvania and the program of its first provost were particularly pernicious to the fortunes and futures of Indigenous neighbors. It is our great pleasure to host this exciting live event in our Spotlight series. Laura and I and members of ASLI's executive committee have envisioned and designed this new series to elevate ASLI members' work in creative writing, scholarship, public engagement, and more. And we are excited to foster connections with new public audiences through these virtual events. As we get started, I want to extend special thanks to the staff at the Penn Program for Environmental Humanities for co-sponsoring and helping with this event, and to the University of Pennsylvania for supplementing our resources at ASLI. Special thanks to Angela Ferranda at PPEH, and thanks also to ASLI's own Amy McIntyre, our Managing Director. This event would not be possible without the work of the Spotlight Planning Committee and the Selection Committee, and we extend gratitude for the many hands who contributed labor, expertise, and time. By way of logistical information, we'll ask that you remain today on mute. We'll have time for questions later, um, and we'll ask you to use the chat or the raised hand function or your reaction buttons to indicate that you have a question. Please try to keep the questions concise since we only have brief minutes together. Amy will staff the controls. Um, normally, or I had anticipated now saying to you that it's my great good fortune to introduce our guest moderator, my co-moderator, Melody Jew. Unfortunately, Melody um, is really feeling quite atrocious after the second dose of her vaccine. Um, but I have Melody's questions uh, that we formulated together earlier this week. Um, and for that reason, I'd like to introduce Melody even in her absence. Later, as we move past the um, presentations, I'm going to be playing Melody here on TV, as well as asking the questions that I formulated myself. Melody is Associate Professor of English at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and her research and teaching interests concern oceans and the environmental humanities, contemporary American literature, media theory, science fiction, science and technology studies, and the relations between theory and practice in both swimming and scuba diving. Professor Ju is the author of Wild Blue Media, Thinking Through Seawater, which appeared with Duke University Press in 2020, and she is co-editor of two forthcoming volumes, both, both with Duke UP. 
Melody would have now introduced our panelists. Uh, so pretend now that I am Melody. I'm delighted to introduce Craig Santos Perez. Craig is an indigenous Chamorro poet from the Pacific Island of Guahan or Guam, and he has published five books of poetry. He is professor in the English department at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, where he teaches creative writing, eco-poetry and Pacific literature, and is affiliate faculty with the Center for Pacific Island Studies and the Indigenous Politics Program. Steve Mance, our second presenter today, is professor of English at St. John's University in New York City, where he teaches Shakespeare, literary theory, and the blue humanities, a term he coined, and focuses on environmental questions. His most recent books are Ocean, which we'll hear about today, as well as Break Up the Anthropocene and author two of Shipwreck Modernity. Thirdly, Brian Russell Roberts is professor of English and director of American studies at Brigham Young University. In addition to Border Waters, his recent publications include the co-edited collections, Archipelagic American Studies and Indonesian Notebook a source book on Richard Wright and the Bandung Conference. And then finally, Tori Bush is a PhD candidate and instructor at Louisiana State University. Her dissertation, Eco-Orientalism, Constructing Climate Migration, is an interdisciplinary investigation into how the very small island of Ile de Jean Charles has been constructed through a white Western lens of literature, media, and other cultural objects as an environmental sacrifice zone or eco-orientalized in order to experiment with processes and procedures of climate migration in the United States. With no further ado, over to you, Craig. Well, half a day, aloha. Thank you so much, uh, Bethany and Amy, and everyone at ASLI for organizing this event. I'm honored to be part of such a stellar lineup. I'm zooming, zooming in from the island of Oahu, so I also want to acknowledge the Kanaka Oivi, or Native Hawaiian people. Uh, today I'll be uh, talking about my new book, Habitat Threshold, which is a collection of climate and eco-poetry uh, intersecting with poems about being a new parent. My daughter was born in 2014. Uh, for my uh, five minutes today, I'm going to actually perform one of the poems from the book. It is titled Chanting the Waters, and it's dedicated to the Standing Rock tribe and water protectors around the world. And so I'm going to ask my fellow panelists if they can unmute themselves. They're going to help me uh, perform this call and response poem. And so when I say, say, they're going to repeat, water is life. Say, Water, water, is life. water is life. Because our bodies are 60% water. Because my wife labored for 24 hours through contracting waves. Because water breaks forth from shifting tectonic plates. Say, water, water, water is, is life. life. Because amniotic fluid is 90% water. Because she breathed and breathed and breathed. Because our lungs are 80% water. Because our daughter crowned like a new island. Say, Water, water, water is life. Water. Because we tell creation stories about water. Because our language flows from water. Because our words are islands writ on water. Because it takes more than three gallons of water to make a single sheet of paper. Say, water, water, water is life. life. Because water is the next oil. Because 180,000 miles of U.S. oil pipelines leak every day. Because our planet is 70% water because it takes two gallons of water to refine one gallon of gasoline, because it takes 20 gallons of water to make a pound of plastic. Say, water, 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 water is, life. is life. Because a billion people lack access to drinking water, because women and children walk four miles every day to gather clean water and deliver it home, because our bones are 30% water. Say, water, water is life. life. 
because corporations privatize, dam, and bottle our waters, because plantations divert our waters, because animal slaughterhouses consume our waters, because pesticides, chemicals, lead, and waste poison our waters, say? Water. Water is life. Because they bring their bulldozers and drills and drones, because we bring our feathers and lay and sage and shells and canoes and hashtags and totems, because they call us savage and primitive and riot, because we bring our treaties and the declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples, because they bring their banks and dogs and paychecks and pepper spray and bullets, because we bring our songs and schools and prayers and chants and ceremonies, because we say stop, keep the oil in the ground, because they say shut up and vanish, because we are not moving, because we bring all our relations and all our generations and all our live streams, say, water, water is life, because our drumming sounds like rain after drought echoing against taut skin, because our skin is 60% water, say, Water. Water is life. Because every year, millions of children die from waterborne diseases. Because every day, thousands of children die from waterborne diseases. Because by the end of this poem, five children will die from waterborne diseases. Say, Water, water is life. Because our daughter loves playing in the ocean. Because someday she'll ask, Where does the ocean end? because we'll point to the dilating horizon, because our eyes are 95% water, because we'll tell her ocean has no end, because sky and clouds lift ocean, because mountains embrace ocean into blessings of rain, because ocean, sky, rain fills aquifers and lakes, because ocean, sky, rain, lake flows into the Missouri River, because ocean, sky, rain, lake, river, returns to the Pacific and connects us to our cousins at Standing Rock because our blood is 90% water. Say, water, water is life. life. Because our hearts are 75% water. Because I'll teach our daughter, our people's word for water, Hanum, Hanum, Hanum. So the sound of water will always carry her home. Say, Water, water is life. life. Say. Water, water is life. Say. Water, water is, is life. life. Thank you, mahalo. I look forward to our conversation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Over to you, Steve. Uh, th thank you so much, Craig. That's such a beautiful poem and a wonderful beginning to um, what I hope will be a really rich conversation. I'm so pleased to see um, so many people here in, in Zoom world. Um, I want to thank also um, Asley for uh, convening this, this forum and also for inviting me and especially for Bethany and Amy and Melody and Absentia for, um, for uh, helping to organize and, and uh, foster these conversations. I'm really uh, excited to be here and really pleased to be um, speaking and thinking and um, you know, sort of playing in the water with, with everybody here. Um, so I am very happy to be speaking to you in the weirdness of Zoomtopia from my home in Brantford, Connecticut. Um, I'd like briefly to acknowledge the indigenous peoples and nations who have lived with these lands and waters for many generations, including the Mohegan, the Massantucket Pequod, the Eastern Pequod, the Scaticoke, the Golden Hill Pogusset, Niantic, Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin speaking peoples. Um, I honor the members of these communities past, present, and emerging. And as I may talk about a little bit more uh, later on in our conversation, if we get to one of the questions that Melody uh, devised for this project, um, uh, this is a deeply local book. I wrote this book right here in this place and in the water down the street from my house um, in the constant physical presence of this little piece of Long Island Sound. Um, and I wanna honor the human and more than human histories of this place as I began. Um, so the book I'm talking about today started as a project to take the ocean 
and fit it into a small object this size that fits in your pocket. Um, that's obviously a difficult project um, for some of the ways that I think we've already heard from that gorgeous um, reinvigoration of the statistics of ocean, uh, ocean presence that, that Craig just gave us. Um, but just to rehearse a couple of them uh, about vastness and, and space, uh, the ocean is vast in space covering 70% of the Earth's surface, even vaster in volume comprising 99% of our planet's biosphere. Um, and also, as Craig showed so powerfully in that poem, uh, vast in terms of its presence in our own bodies, making up more than two thirds of our own fleshy existence in different uh, ratios uh, and, and parts of the body. Um, and it's also vast in time. The story that I tell about the ocean in this book begins with the arrival of the Earth's waters um, uh, during or soon after planetary creation around 4.5 billion years ago. And so the project of this book is to take all that vastness and make it small. Um, I obviously don't get everything in, but I'm hoping that I got at least some of the shapes more or less right. The basic organizing principle of the book comes from an epigraph from Moby Dick in which the grizzled seaman preacher Father Mapple intones, shipmates, it is a two-stranded lesson. The basic duality and split nature of the ocean that the ocean always appears to us as two things. It is alien and core, hostile and nurturing, chaos and order, becomes across the long span of this short book, a principle of organization. The ocean moves and each surge splits and divides. These acts of division comprise not so much principles of order as techniques through which change and disorder can be made to appear orderly, at least for a little while. The ocean that emerges from these entwined strands never simply remains itself. It's always changing shapes and patterns and attributes and relationships. So in writing this book and trying to do justice to that two strandedness of the ocean, I've been inspired and indebted to the two artists whose images appear on the slide that you guys can see right now. Um, and those two images are gonna help me say a little bit more about the oceanic duality that is my primary subject. So on the right, you can see the image of the cover of the book. Um, this was designed by Alice Marwick, the genius designer who's, beyond, behind, who's, who's created all the covers for the great object lessons series. Um, after some discussion, we decided to go with a kind of blue green color um, for the water on the cover of the book. Um, it's partly as a kind of a little dig at the blue humanities, which is sort of my refrain. Um, but the, you know, as we all know, and as the cover shows us, the ocean isn't only blue. One of the things I really love about Alice's image um, is the way it captures texture, depth, and movement in just a few economical lines. The cover is a great representation of ocean as alien, alluring, and inhuman. And so paired against that, and I hope you can make out the images on the slide, um, paired against that on the other side is the last of the 13 black and white drawings that were done for the book by the Irish swimmer artist, Vanessa Dawes. Each of her drawings, which appear before each chapter of the book, um, highlights something from out of the book's chapters, from space water crashing onto a bare planet to Im images of Odysseus, Adamastor, the Port of New York, sailing ships, globalization, and Emily Dickinson splashing into the surf. The image on this slide comes from the last chapter in the book, which is about ocean swimming. I love the crowded surface of this image. It's dense with bodies and with uh, our arcing elbows. I love that most of the faces we can see are half in and half out of the water. The image captures the partial human access to ocean that's at the heart of my big little two-stranded book. So bringing together these two images reminds me that the, the many differences that the book presents are varied ways of getting at what it means to try to think ocean as object and as companion. And the idea that ocean creates human connection uh, also recalls the other one of the two epigraphs that I use at the, at the front of the book. The second epigraph, as I've already said, um, presents Melville and the two-stranded lesson. The first epigraph comes from the poet scientist, Rachel Carson, who wrote in Under the Sea Wind, I realized that the sea itself must be the central character, whether I wished it 
or not. Carson shows in that phrase, which I really love, um, what I also feel, which is that in some ways the ocean chose me and shaped my book in, into the shapes that it takes, whether I wished it or not. Thank you. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, over to you, Brian. Thank you so much, um, Bethany, um, Amy, and Melody for putting this together, and also to Asley. Um, what a, I'm, I'm thrilled to be with these panelists today, um, all of whom I admire, and I also want to um, to acknowledge that I'm here at Brigham Young University in in Utah, um, in a in an area that um, has been the traditional homelands and home waters of indigenous groups, including the Navajo, the Ute, the Paiute, the Shoshone. And um, in making that acknowledgement, I also want to say that I, I strive um, imperfectly oftentimes, but I do strive to, to um, have that acknowledgement um, permeate the, the scholarship that I do and also the, the living that I do. Um, so I'm talking to you today about my book, Border Waters, Amid the Archipelagic States of America. It's due out from Duke University Press next month. I'm very excited about that. It's been a, a long process and a fulfilling and meaningful process. It, I'll start out by just reminding us of the standard story of the United States. Um, the standard story of the United States tells us that the United States is a continental country. We're familiar with this image of the U.S. intent on fulfilling its manifest destiny, crossing a vast continents of prairies and mountain and deserts, extending as a continental landmass from sea to shining sea. Now we can trace this image of the U.S. as a continent all the way back to Thomas Paine, who in 1776 said that it was absurd for an island, now that is Imperial England, to perpetually govern a continent, and that was the nascent and settler colonial United States. In this conventional story of the United States founding an east-west expansion, the continent is the nation's founding and foundational geographical form. But Border Waters asks what would happen if instead of looking toward the continent, we located the foundational US geography in the island ocean form of the archipelago. Now for most readers and most listeners, this will seem like a counterintuitive and even a counterfactual proposition. But Border Waters reminds us that while it may be counterintuitive, it's far from counterfactual. In fact, the United States claims more ocean space than it does land space and more ocean space than perhaps any other country in the world. And this is so by virtue of the many US claims to islands and archipelagos in the Pacific and the Caribbean, and also by virtue of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which in 1982 provided for a nation to claim a territorial sea 12 miles out from its shoreline, and then an exclusive economic zone that extends 200 miles out from its territorial sea. So this watery version of the United States isn't a secret. It's posted on a current website of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, titled Maritime Zones and Boundaries. This website hosts a document which states, quote, the U.S. exclusive economic zone is the largest in the world, containing 3.4 million square nautical miles of ocean, larger than the combined area of all 50 states. The United States, the document asserts, is an ocean nation. So this is conventional U.S. geography turned on its head. The United States becomes a visible, visible as a country made up predominantly of oceanic and archipelagic spaces, with just a minority claim to the North American continent. Further, and just as surprising, the United States does not simply border two countries, the canonical borders with Mexico and Canada, but it borders some 21 countries scattered across the globe. 
And astoundingly, this watery map of the United States reminds us that the US and world borders today are preponderantly oceanic. And their border waters, I would add, are archipelagic. Drawing on oceanic and archipelagic thinkers, including Edward Glissant, Zora Neale Hurston, Florence Johnny Frisbee, Epele Haofa, and Craig Santos Perez. The chapters of this book re-describe the United States and its planetary embeddedness in a way that finds touchstones in a series of cultural ecological events. These include the ways that massive Pacific and Caribbean hurricanes cause inundations and remake fundamental U.S. ecological narratives, the way nuclear testing in New Mexico borderlands and Marshall Islands border waters evokes interrelated testimonies and testimonios against the invisibility of desert and ocean island spaces, the way Japanese American artists unconstitutionally imprisoned in Utah in the Utah desert during World War II engaged in beachcombing 10,000 years or even half a billion years after the fact, making sense of asymmetrical human ecologies during World War II by contemplating mollusk shells from an ice age lake and fossils from the Cambrian Ocean. It further addresses the way that albatrosses in the Papahanaumoku Akea Marine National Monument in feeding plastic bottle caps to their chicks are actually curating evidence that the beverage industry has convinced humans that we are 60% cola rather than 60% water. So Border Waters was born out of my own experiences growing up in Hawaii, Indonesia, and Tennessee. These are archipelagic and continental spaces that a settler colonial and imperial United States has claimed are bordered. This watery map of the United States may seem like common sense to those who have lived in the border waters and the archipelagos, but for a majority of US citizens and US watchers throughout the world, a border waters map turns the country's geography and ecological relationship to itself upside down and inside out. Thank you. Over to you, Tori. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me here today. I have long admired everyone on this panel's work, so it's an honor for me. Um, also, thank you so much to or the facilitators and organizers and for everyone who's listening. Um, I wanted to start by sharing a photo of how I start most of my mornings. If you can see this really small image on the bottom right hand corner of my PowerPoint slide, um, you'll see my two pups, uh, Max and Ada. <laughs> we begin each morning, often around sunrise, although this is their decision more than mine with a long walk along the Mississippi River. I live very close to where the mouth of the Mississippi expands itself out into the depths of the Gulf of Mexico and watch its movements each morning. Because of this, I'm ever aware of the fluctuations of the water around me, its ability to sustain my home, but also the possibility of destruction. Water moves inside and around us constantly. Myself and my co-editor, Richard Goodman, who's a professor of creative nonfiction at the University of New Orleans, um, began to discuss how this last century has scraped and marked our environment physically, but also in terms of language, how our thinking and imagining of the Gulf has changed. When Catherine Cole, who was the first female journalist for the New Orleans Times-Picayune, described her trip to Last Island through Oyster Bayou in 1888, she, uh, she said, it was a winding, uncertain, oyster-reefed lane where on either side are marshes of rotting, porous, fiddler-eating fiddler crusts of half-earth, half-sand, sown thick with a rank, coarse growth of sea rushes. This decomposing richness is not the same language one would use if you visited today. If you visit Oyster Bayou or even look at it on Google Maps, you can see an oil pipeline cutting through and the winding waterways now widened due to the rising seas and land subsidence. The parameters of this anthology are marked by time. Um, their works from about the last century uh, by space. We focus on the Gulf South, specifically the coastal areas and its waterways. 
by genre. We include poetry, prose, nonfiction, scholarly works, graphic texts, and journalism, as well as an aim to present uh, multiracial, multi-generational, and multi-species narratives. Um, we began this anthology by reaching out to over 60 journalists, writers, scholars, scientists, and activists to see what books informed their understanding of their work. From there, our bibliography grew exponentially and over uh, quite an amount of time, we eventually whittled it down to the 44 um, writers and artists that we've included in this book. A few things that I just want to mention that I feel are important parts or parameters of this book as well, is um, while this anthology is defined by human borders, um, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas are our sort of focus. I really imagine this collection as being defined by the shared ecologies of this region, much more so than the social political boundaries. Um, I also want to think about how settler colonial and plantation strategies have lingered in how we think and live with the ecologies of the Gulf South. Steve Lerner's Diamond um, is one of the texts in this anthology that points to how the petrochemical industry, which fuels our nation, is built literally on top of the plantation sites. Um, I was also interested in seeing how different genres can enrich our vocabula vocabulary about climate change. Um, what can poets offer? Uh, what language can they offer to journalists about this ongoing uh, ecological change, but also vice versa? Um, I think putting them in the same room together has offered some surprising results at times. Um, and then I also wanted to point to the long history of environmental activism. Um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas's River of Grass, Robert Bullard's Dumping in Dixie, and more recently Peggy Franklin's book, um, Women Pioneers of the Louisiana Environmental Movement, are all sort of signposts to how I see um, a narrative that is not as well discussed, talking about how the environmental movement has deep roots in the South. Um, finally, I want to add um, that this is the first anthology of this region. Um, and hopefully there will be many more. There are certainly many more approaches that should be taken. Um, however, it does make sense that it comes out in this moment because of the very unique material reality in which the Gulf South is existing. Um, our coastlines are disappearing, um, especially in Louisiana at a faster rate than anywhere in the nation. Um, the first US federal climate migrants are found here as well as Alaska. Um, and this is also home to a third of the oil and gas industry in the United States, which suggests how these industries both implicate themselves in our uncertain eco ecological as well as energy futures. Um, and thank you so much. Um, thanks, Bethany. Thank you. Thank you, Tori. Thanks to all um, four of our presenters and authors today. I'm going to dive right into the questions, beginning with one authored by Melody. So this is from Melody to you. My question to start is about what we might call waters or oceans in the particular, borrowing from anthropologist Tim Choi's discussion of ecologies in the particular. Sometimes it can be easy to think of the water abstractly as a homogeneous body with material properties such as salinity or depth. Yet in each of your works, there are moments that focus on phenomena specific to particular aquatic habitats. Coral spawning in Craig's poem, Sonnet at the Edge of a Reef, or Tori's thinking about the confluence of ocean, delta, river in the Gulf South. Steve's discussion of getting to know place through swimming, and at a bit larger scale, Brian's articulation of archipelagic thought in relation to economic territoriality in the Pacific and Caribbean. Could each of you reflect on how particular waters and the history of those waters have informed your work? Feel free to respond in any order. There are four of you. I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, 
the water in particular, or sea in particular, that um, inflects my work probably the most would be the, I mean, the figure of the archipelago, the geographical form of the archipelago. Oftentimes we think of the archipelago as made up as being a series of islands. When we think of the archipelago, we think, okay, it's a series of islands. Um, but one of the things that um, in archipelagic thinking, archipelagic studies, um, scholars have reminded us of is that the archipelago has a specific genealogy and it's not simply the islands. It's an island ocean complex. Um, archipelago ar uh, arose in, in, um, in Italian and it has kind of um, Greek borrowings. So the um, archi signifies chief and pelago signifies sea. So the archipelago was the chief sea, referring to the Aegean Sea. And um, because the Aegean Sea had many islands, by transference, archipelago came to refer to a group of islands. As the, um, during the era of colonial modernity, as, as um, Europeans went throughout the world, they would see other groups of islands and say, oh, archipelago, archipelago, archipelago. And so the archipelago trope, um, which is islands mostly with this forgotten ocean component, um, has expanded throughout the world. Um, but what you got in the mid 20th century was post-colonial states like the Philippines, like Indonesia, um, loudly reminding the West as they were negotiating the emergence of their own post-colonial archipelagic states, um, that archipelago includes water. And so the way we use archipelago now internationally um, winds up having affixed to it some um, land ocean definitions um, that are inspired by Indonesian relations to water. Um, for instance, Tana Air and, um, and Nusantara. Um, and so the water in the archipelago has been restored, um, post-colonialized. I, I guess I would also say that focusing on this land island water complex of the archipelago helps to, to um, and, and taking that as something in particular helps to overturn um, hundreds of years of continental baggage that we have through people like Frederick Hegel, who told the entire history of the world through the continent, um, and then said history can't happen on a desert island. Um, and so when we tell stories about water and islands together, we're, we're rewriting the history of the world through a water in particular. Tori, Craig, Steve? Yeah, I'll, I'll add on to that because I sort of ha some had something very similar to say about um, sort of the, the narratives that we speak about water is often sort of how it shapes that specificity um, uh, in terms of ecologies as well as culturally and politically. Um, so I think I, I lean on the writers in this anthology who together collaborate on making a, their own specific meaning of the Gulf South. Um, they create this discursive meaning simply by being placed together, by being read together. Um, but also I would point to the, when thinking about a regional space, I think there's, there has to be a spectrum of specificity to, to consider, right? Um, Diane Wilson, who is one of the um, authors in the text, her Sea Drift Texas has its own distinct ecological and political crises, while Natasha Trethewey's Mississippi Gulf Coast sees in the aftermath of Katrina the impact of denuding the mangrove forests and building man-made white sand beaches and casinos. So there is a shared shared eco, like ecological spaces, of course, but within that, there is always a spectrum of that specificity. And then further, I think that there's also the specificity of, um, uh, of uh, the, a single place. I think about Eddie Harris, who's a black writer who kayaked down the entire Mississippi. And he saw very different things in those waters than Joy Harjo, who's um, in her poem, New Orleans, which looks into the waters of the Mississippi. Um, by all this, I guess what I mean is that specificity of place is a spectrum, um, which is sort of toggled by history and narrative and materiality and, and subject position. Thank you. 
I was just going to add, uh, you know, my book was entirely written while I was living here in Hawaii. And so uh, many of the poems are, are grounded in the waters here, as well as the larger Pacific. So I have poems about uh, coral bleaching, uh, the Great Pacific garbage plastic patch, uh, overfishing and the endangerment of marine life, uh, toxic contamination by militarism, nuclearism, and other colonial forces, and of course, sea level rise. And so, you know, trying to write about our local waters, but also uh, thinking about water and the ocean as a metaphor for fluidity and flow and, and connection, you know, so also trying to uh, connect some of the water rights struggles here in the Pacific to other parts of, of North America and around the world. And so that's kind of how I try to write poems that are both uh, place-based and planetary uh, and connected through water. Yeah, and I, I would just maybe chime in to, to support all, all of these comments about the, the value of this sort of intense particularity um, in our relationships with individual bodies of water. And I'm thinking obviously of the body of water that I, you know, down the street from me in my local part of uh, Long Island Sound where the water is still right now too cold for me to go swimming in for another month or so. But um, I, I also want to think a little bit about just the relationship between the particular and the act of abstraction um, and maybe even stick up a little bit for abstraction as, a, as an intellectual process, a speculative process that it seems to me, and maybe this is just my kind of two-strandedness obsession, that it's, it's sort of in toggling back and forth. So I think it's like I was saying partly about local poems that are also global poems, that, that the, like the deep dive into a particular also enables the kind of surfacing into abstraction, or maybe I've got the, you know, which one is surfacing and which one is diving backwards. But, um, you know, that like it, it, it is moving back and forth between an act of particularism and an act of abstraction that I think it's like, it, like that's the, um, like that's, it seems to me the really fun and generative part of, um, of water studies or, 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 you know, the kinds of, creative and critical writing that I think many of us are, are, are thinking about and practicing here. Thanks for those really rich responses and they really um, lead so nicely into our next broad question. Um, this one is from me. Um, in your work variously in Craig's poetry or the object ocean or Brian's archipelagic history and thinking in Tori's Gulf, waters seem to enable writerly agency or abstraction or planetarity. While we must always think waters in the plural, let's consider it just for a moment elementally here. Across its cultured particularity and layered histories across the river, gulf, and ocean that is the Gulf South. For Craig, and Craig, you already alluded to this, um, ocean water provides a medium for poesis and connection. And for Steve, it's an object for theory creation. And for Brian, it's a cru crucial correction to both ocean or continental nationalism. And for Tori and your co-editor and writers, it's a gathering, a geocultural formation. But I'm curious about moments in your work where water might push back against writerly agency. Is water always a good collaborator? Can you share some experiences when water thwarts your intentions, resists, floods, or dare I say, liquidates your plans? Just jump in in any order you like. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in really quickly just because this is the time of year when I feel most frustratingly um, uh, alienated from the water around me, um, partly because, uh, you know, I, I'm a relatively uh, warm water swimmer and living in a cold water climate, so I, I don't swim very much between, say, December and the end of April or beginning of May. So I, like, in this time period, I feel like that particular kind of uh, physical and intimate connection with the water, which is so generative for me, is, like, temporarily excluded from it. And, you know, I know I could get wetsuits and stuff, but, um, but the, the, the way in which water is, for, is both alluring and frustrating seems to be part of the, um, 
can be part of the relationship, I would say. Um, so, so, so in that sense, it is both frustrating and um, I, I guess I would say tempting. I love this question, uh, Bethany. It's a, it feels like a poem waiting to happen. And there are definitely uh, two moments in the Chanting the Waters poem I read where water itself seemed to flood in. And one was when I started thinking about uh, hidden water or embedded water, especially when you know, I talk about how many gallons of water it takes just to make a single piece of paper. And that was a moment where it felt like water had, had thwarted my intentions and had come into to the poem to remind me that the page I'm writing on itself is composed of water as well. Uh, there was a second moment when uh, you know, I started learning about how many children around the world are, are impacted by waterborne diseases. And somehow the, you know, the water came in to, to tell me that by the end of this poem, this many children will have been you know, uh, in, impacted by, by these diseases. And so those were just two moments where it felt, you know, wasn't conscious intention, but it seemed the water itself coming in uh, to kind of teach me these lessons. Yeah, um, I had a very strong response to this question too, perhaps because I felt very um, divided about it. I feel very of two perspectives. Um, one, certainly like thinking like narratologically, um, there's so many great texts in this book by so many great writers who employ water as sort of a, uh, a character, um, clearly. Um, one of the texts is by Jasmine Ward, uh, Salvage the Bones. Um, it's a moment where her, her, the family from this book is stuck in the attic um, as a hurricane is coming. And the waters are, are rising and they're uh, trying to find a way to escape. So she sort of personifies, or, or honestly, I think she animalizes the water. Um, she writes, there's a lake growing in the yard. It moves under the broken trees like a creeping animal, a wide nosed snake. Its head disappears under the house where we stand. Its tail's wider and wider, like it has eaten something greater than itself. And I would say that, you know, Jasmine Ward is, is a resident of Miss, the Mississippi coast and, and now Louisiana as well, knows very intimately that water has its own agency. Um, it moves, it changes things, it has power. Uh, in many ways, water is an excellent collaborator for a writer because it offers so much non-human agency. I also think of um, two photographers, Keith and Chandra McCormick, um, who are from New Orleans. Um, and in a sense collaborated with water when they came home to find their studio inundated, but went on to show those prints as completed works. Water was part collaborator as well as part of the process of that art. However, my other reaction to that is a very somatic response um, where I think it is also essential to acknowledge the collaboration of, with water is a, a dangerous and, and potentially fickle thing. Um, I, uh, you know, live in a place where there have been many lives lost to the water. And so that is uh, a very real part of that response that I always try to keep in mind. Thank you, Tori. Uh, um, I, live, I live in Utah Valley, which is just south of the Salt Lake Valley. Um, the Salt Lake Valley is where the Great Salt Lake is. I live in um, an Indophreic region um, where water from the rivers does not make it to the seas. Um, one of the interesting things that that's done for the region is, you know, 10,000 years ago, if you were here, my building, the building that I'm in currently would be maybe 300 feet under the water. Um, there was a massive um, pluvial lake, the Lake Bonneville that was here. And um, Lake Bonneville has been, I would say, in some ways a collaborator with me as I've written the book Border Waters. Um, lake Bonneville fostered the, the mollusk shells that then were used by Japanese American prisoners in the Utah desert to make jewelry. And um, in collaboration with um, 
the Japanese American prisoners in collaboration with the mollusk shells, in collaboration with Lake Bonneville, I wrote a chapter on um, the art that emerged from the Topaz internment camp. Um, and so I've looked to water as a collaborator. It's also been a disruptor. And that same, the same Bonneville Basin has been a disruptor for me where the fifth chapter of my book starts out taking the spiral jetty by Robert Smithson, which extends out into the Great Salt Lake, one of the um, preeminent pieces of land art um, that's during the, the efflorescence during the 1960s and 70s. And I wanted to go to see the spiral jetty and see what it was like to see this jetty, which is normally straight. I mean, normally a jetty would be straight, right? But then you you go and look at a spiral jetty spiraling out into the water. Um, but the basin didn't cooperate with me in my intention to see um, a jetty spiraling into the water. Instead, the water was low um, as the salt lake fluctuates. And so it may have been three feet below. I mean, the, the jetty was three feet above water level. And so I needed to hike um, an additional 200 yards to get out to the water. It didn't give me the picture of the spiral jetty that I was hoping for, but kind of the difficultness um, of interacting with water and the unpredictability um, is something that I've tried to collaborate, even as water doesn't want to collaborate with me. I've tried to take that and learn from water. Well, really rich answers. Thank you all. Um, there are some questions now coming in on the chat. I thought in the interest of time that we would open the questions now to the audience. Um, Gary Rager had posed a really interesting question about deep time and um, sort of prehistoric waters that Brian, I think you have touched on in the answer you just offered. Um, and the question posed by Prim Rose also bears on timescales and temporalities. Prim, would you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talks. I was just wondering, like, if the speakers can elaborate more on how their conceptualizations of water in relation to a mediation of temporalities in the text that they examine, especially in our globalist conjuncture that tends to emphasize on a kind of ideology of presentism and also given water's um, mythical connect connotations or associations with ideas of infinitude and inexhaustibility. Thank you very much. Thanks for that question. Who would like to respond? I can jump in quickly um, just to say, I mean, thank you for that's a really wonderful and rich, rich question. Um, I think that the, the tradition which holds the ocean to be outside of history and outside of time is one of the things that the sort of current moment in ocean scholarship, ocean history, ocean writing um, is like, that's one of the things we're, we're, I think collectively, or at least maybe I can speak for myself, I think it's something that we need to fix. Um, I think that there are, you know, feelings of something much larger than ourselves are important to the human relationship with the ocean, but the ocean is a historical uh, entity. It is bounded by time, it changes by time, it changes from human and non-human influences. And I think it's really important to, to uh, in some sense, rescue the ocean from this sense of timelessness. Um, I actually think it gets more interesting when we put it back into history. Thanks, Steve. I really like that answer. One of the things that it made me reflect on, and thank you also, Prim, um, for your question, um, which I really enjoy thinking about. Um, it makes me think about the um, fractal mathematics of Benoit Mandelbrot, um, which um, Edward Glissant took up also. Um, um, Mandelbrot, you may know, is, I mean, is famous for having this scene in which he says, um, how do you measure the coast of an island? Um, you start off with a human walking along the coast, but then you need to get into smaller um, sub-peninsulas and sub-bays, sub-sub-peninsulas, sub-sub-bays. And so you might harness an ant, he says, and then you might harness, or you might harness a mouse, and you might harness an ant, 
And the human, the mouse, the ant, each have um, a different length between their footsteps. As you keep shortening the length, Mandelbrot says, you get to an infinite coastline as the, as the, as the length of measurement decreases the length of the coastline um, increases with no bound. And it's an interesting moment because it touches on that infinity that you're talking about, how the ocean collaborates with um, Edward Glissant, with um, Mandelbrot and thinking through infinity, but it's not an infinity of the unbounded like um, traditional ocean thought is where you've got this ocean is vast, ocean is vast, it's inexhaustible. This is an infinity of the bounded, an infinity that is exhaustible on human scales, even as it's inexhaustible on other scales that we're not even aware of. I think that um, this works for space, fractal space, um, as the ocean instructs us on fractal space. I think the ocean also instructs us on fractal temporality as we watch um, nested times um, become nested in each other. I mean, one of the things that I've thought about with the, the Bonneville Lake that's here is the idea of the foreshore. And traditionally you think of the foreshore as between the high and the low tide. But if you could abstract that, it could be between any two water levels. And so the, the, the metaphorical tide might be 10,000 years. It might be between two waves of 20 seconds. Um, and so I think that fractal mathematics and the way the ocean collaborates with us in that realm um, is a useful way for thinking about some of the things that you were asking about, Prim. Um, that's fascinating. Um, I think one of the um, sort of like inheritances of thinking about a place regionally is oftentimes is, oh, there's always a question of scaling, um, scaling, whether it's uh, very specific issues or like scaling to like planetary size questions. And so I guess one of the things that I take with me in terms of the conceptualization of water is I see it fundamentally as like a question of scales from thinking about like the sedimentation that arrives through the Mississippi Delta to uh, create the, some of the newest land um, to sort of like the, the depths of the Gulf. Um, which seem to hold different times. And I guess that's sort of um, akin to what Brian was saying. I think thinking about it, not in terms of linear times, but how that there's certain, um, there's different spaces of time within, within this ecology, I guess is how I've been thinking about it. Thank you for that question. Yeah, I'll just add quickly that, you know, the last poem in, in my book is called Praise Song for Oceania. And the last lines of that poem go, praise our trans-oceanic past, present, future flowing through our blood. And so I was just think, you know, that those lines for me kind of encapsulate how water in the ocean, you know, can flow throughout history, present and, and the future and, and bringing those senses together through our own bodies. Oh. Inevitably, we're coming short on time and just as questions are really starting to percolate through, um, I would like to um, hear the hear the speakers respond uh, to the question posed by Tina Gerhardt in the chat, uh, asking and or really commanding you if you would please comment on the lessons of the past for navigating present sea level rise and future sea level rise. Um, this is something I've, uh, I feel like I, I deal with and I live with a lot. Um, and I think there's a lot of responses to this question. Um, one thing that I think um, I'm in good company here in this room is that I do think that um, language uh, creates new space, new ways, new ways of living. And so I do 
fundamentally believe that like by thinking and making and creating art, we will continue to evolve um, ways of living with water. I, I also think there's just fundamental like living with water policies that could be put in place with um, really recognizing the fact that like humans are not the center of an ecology, that we have to think as a network and how water informs and moves through that network. Um, concrete needs to be <laughs> totally rethought, at least at least in New Orleans living here, um, where people are just pulling out concrete because they've realized that's what maintains the wa water and floods ground um, and makes it dangerous. So gardens, more soil, more, you know, decomposing things. Um, so I think all of these are part of that answer. Thanks for this question. One of the things that it makes me think about is the closing section of Zora Neale Hurston's famous novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, which of course a hurricane shows up um, and the levee on Lake Okeechobee collapses and floods Palm Beach County. Um, and it transforms this continental space into a set of island spaces that Janie and Tea Cake are alternately wading and swimming through. If you go back and read that um, final section, I think there's a lot of wisdom that Hearst impact into it um, that, that we can then um, take and use as, as templates, as a template for how to think about sea level rise. Um, we've got indigenous characters. How are they given attention in that novel? We've got black folk, we've got white folk. What are the different power asymmetrical roles that they're playing? We've got animals that show up. How are humans interacting with these animals and how are the different demographics of humans interacting with these animals? Um, Hurston's novel ends in um, kind of ambiguous tragedy and yet amb ambiguous liberation. Um, and one of the things that I like most about the end of Hurston's novel is it ends with a, I guess what you would say, a non-monological version of love. Um, and Janie says, love is like the sea. It's a moving thing, but it's different with every shore it meets. And I think that that novel, and especially the end, is a offers a template for the types of love and concern um, and care that we need to offer um, to fellow humans, to the environment, to animals, to plants, to indigenous elders. Thank you, Brian. Steve or Craig, would you like to respond? I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I know that we're, we're, we're tight on time. Um, I mean, I love the question and I think it's the, it's like the fundamental reason why I'm drawn to this work is to think about what happens as the ocean, um, it becomes increasingly intimate with our lives and our cities and our houses and our, our, um, uh, you know, all the, and the, the, the places in which we live. Um, one of the things that I, um, like to, to give just a little tiny nugget out of my book, um, I talk about the difference in literary history between a literary history uh, focused on the great hero Achilles and a literary history focused on Odysseus, that the one is a, is a tragic warrior who fights against his environment and his enemies, and the other is a wily mariner who, um, you know, invents tools and trickery. Um, and I think about the difference between a, a world based on Achilles values and one based on Odysseus values. Not that Odysseus, like Odysseus has his problems too, um, but I think that there are habits of thought and cultural creation that are amenable to maritime circumstances that are not always the ones that, um, that the existing tradition that we inherit um, you know, based in some sense, I think, as Brian's work, Brian work, Brian's work shows so clearly on these sort of continental terrestrial imperial models. Um, I think we just need different models. Um, and I actually think we have them. We just have to sort of uh, de-earth them, if you will, uh, and, and, and focus on the, on the watery inheritance. I'll just add quickly that you know, here in the Pacific for the past 50 years, our wayfinding and seafaring traditions are being revitalized. 
And so much of Pacific navigation involves reading the stars and the ocean currents and other natural phenomena in order to safely navigate uh, archipelagic spaces. And so I feel like, you know, being attuned to the earth and to its changing signs um, and being able to, you know, develop our environmental and, and marine literacies uh, will help us navigate the, the changing climate and the precarious days that, that we face ahead. Thank you. Thank you for those rich responses. Thanks to all of you for joining us, for your questions, for your listening, for your attention. And please join me in thanking especially our speakers, Craig, Tori, Steve, Brian. What a pleasure. Thank you so much for your work and for being with Asley today.